Welcome back everyone to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill and by popular demand, I'm delighted again to be able to speak to Jamie Constable of N Plus One, singer, one of the smartest capital markets experts in the city. So uh, welcome, Jamie. Hello, Paul. Great to be back again. Yeah, well, the big news overnight is that the Federal Reserve is becoming slightly more hawkish um, in terms mm. of its interest rates and monetary policy, a larger on the back of inflationary pressures, which I think you've been talking about for quite some time. So uh, what's your interpretation of the news and sort of the impact potentially on markets going forward? Well, I think, I mean, we say they've been a bit more hawkish. It's kind of at the margin, to be honest, because if you read mm. the statement from the uh, from the FOMC statement, it's hardly changed from last time. What actually moved the markets was the inflation plot, the dot plot, they call it. Yeah. So they're now talking about interest rate rises, two of them in 2023. Mm. But to be honest, I mean, 2023, what cycle are we going to be in by then? It's 2021 now. Who knows? We could have been up and down by then. Yeah. I think we're increasingly at the stage now where markets are, are going to worry more about the Fed and other central banks getting behind the curve. I think that's what we have to think about. Inflation, as you say, we've talked about it at length on our previous uh, mm. on our previous podcast. But uh, where are we now? Uh, US five well, percent? Yeah, I mean that's really quite interesting, actually, because it rocketed from two percent to five percent. And will the UK? Because we had a two percent print yesterday, or two point one. Two point one. Yeah. It, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about you, but there's little difference between a UK consumer and a US consumer to me. And other than the, the you know, sterling slightly dampening inflation, I, I, are you likely to see another a, a big print of similar ilk in the UK? Well, if you look at the Bank of England, they reckon it's going to average two and a half percent in the UK this year. So the answer is yes, it's going up. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of our channel checks. We talked about this again before, but. Brits up 20% if you want to mm. buy Brits now. We yeah. know the shortage of concrete. It's, 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 it's well known now, all these product shortages. More and more companies in their updates are, are announcing product uh, chain, uh, supply chain issues. You've also got the whole uh, logistics uh, issues mm. as well. And on that front, everyone's seeing higher freight costs as well. Yeah. Wages, they're going up. I mean, the, the government's got a problem, hasn't it, because of the triple uh, lock they announced. Yeah, uh, when the inflation the numbers coming out, yeah, on the pensions, yeah, yeah, you're going to get a big. That's going to increase their debt because uh, they're going to have that big increase. They're going to have to yeah. put through if they hold. Well, we had well, we had employment data, right, didn't we, last week or something in the UK, and it said that basically wages have gone up five point six percent. And what I found was quite interesting, and I think the, the Fed have have sort of like finally accepted the truth is that actually labour markets aren't quite as mobile. And as flexible, because we've, we all know that employers are really struggling to get employ, you know, employees. There's 9.3 million job vacancies in the US. And there's about 800,000 in the UK. And frankly, you know, we can't get the people into the job. So that just by law of supply and demand, the wages must go up. Yeah. I mean, talking about job vacancies in the UK, talking to uh, uh, people in the leisure industry in London alone, there's 40 to 45,000 vacancies in hospitality and wow. they can't get the people. I mean, yeah. you've got a perfect storm there, really, that you've had Brexit and you've had the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and we all know uh, around the country, a lot of the people who work in hospitality are European students or whatever they might be. They can't get back into the UK. They might not be able to get back into the UK anyway because they can't get a visa. Yeah. So who's going to fill those jobs? I mean, all across the press, the farmers can't get people to be, to. Uh, pick the crops in the fields and they're yeah. paying high salaries to get people to do it now in yeah. the u.s the same i mean companies are increased ashted mentioned it yesterday they're having to increase their wages to keep their people mm. uh, and to attract new people so yeah let's go back to the fed what did the fed say they've looking for interest rate rises they still haven't taped in 2023 they still didn't mention the taper word though they're when still do you think they'll start though that's the key they should have started now. Let's be blunt. Yeah, they should okay. be tapering already. I mean, Canada was the first. New Zealand. Why do I mention New Zealand? Tiny little island off uh, down in uh, Australasia. But they're often seen as the precursor to what happens around the rest, rest of the world because they're such an open economy. Mm. They are talking about interest rate rises next year now as well. Uh, and they're tapering. Yeah. I think what we need to remember is this. It's not just the monetary stimulus that we've got at the moment. It's the fiscal stimulus that you've got mm. on top of it. It's the combination of both. If you just had the monetary, maybe you could argue keep it on. But the governments are pumping the money in as well. Yeah. If, we if we come back to the UK, what is the risk to the UK economy from here? Um, 
the risk, we've still got the one risk, I think, which is the end of furlough. Mm. Um, that comes in September. But as we said, UK, you said about US vacancies just yes. then. UK vacancies are at record levels as well. Yes. Jobs are out there. And, and your point about mobility of labour, I think, is a very good one as well. Mm. Do some of these people, are some of these people not going to come back to work now? Mm. Um, I mean, there was a survey done uh, recently, and it said a third of people are still self isolating yes. because they're worried about what might happen if they go out and they might catch the virus. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, the Obviously, scare taxes was part of getting everyone vaccinated, so that's worked. But there's still a third of people who maybe aren't available to work. Yeah. So, yeah, supply and demand, wages going up. And I think what we have to be aware of that the markets marking that central banks have got behind the curve. Yeah. And that's the markets. Again, why I think we're sitting where we were when we talked last time almost, markets aren't really moving much. Yeah. But we're gonna. What we could see, though, going forward, is a tightening of the tightening. Essentially, this is really the first precursor that the the the, 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 the market will start really sort of like testing the, the central banks to to start either tapering or raising interest rates sooner than previously expected. Yeah, I think that's it. The, the, the markets will test them. I mean, bond yields. Let's be honest, though. I mean, I wasn't right on bond yields. They've come back down. Uh, so bond yields came Not all last the night, there. they didn't. They, they no, went they to the went US 10 year and up another 809 basis points. Yeah, yeah. But they did come back down to 1.4, some, you know, just low 1.4s. They're back above 1.5 again now. Um, but yes, if we see inflation continuing to come in at higher numbers and yeah. I think it will through this year, then you are going to see the central banks challenged. Um, and that comes back to where do you want to be? Yeah. Again, you want to be in equities. You don't want to be in bonds if that's going to happen. Yeah, with pricing power, I guess, isn't it? As we said last time, yeah. Pricing yeah. power is everything. When you, you, There's no end of companies now, I've mentioned, squeeze supply chain, stock sword shortages. Mm -hmm. um, when you've got that, and if you look at PPI, the other uh, producer prices, um, the pressure between input and output is really on now. Yeah. So they need to have pricing power to be able to pass on that inflation, which they're seeing not just in inputs, it's in the service side, i.e., Transport, as we said, logistics, all of those. Uh, I mean, talk about job shortages. There's a job shortage of truck drivers in the UK as well. Yeah. Um, it's across the board. It's everywhere. Uh, you need they, they need to be able to pass on those price rises, yeah. which is what we're seeing. Yeah. And what, just turning now sort of like from, from, the, from the macro to sort of like uh, the sort of the fundraising, another big sort of mm. like, you know, changer has been the sort of the strength or previous strength, though, certainly the first part of the year of the IPO and the secondary listing mm. market. How, what are you seeing there? I, what, you're seeing a lot of IPOs in the market. Yeah. Uh, is the IPO indigestion? I think some of the share price reactions after ipo like made.com yesterday yeah so there's a little bit of indigestion there what i would always say on this is that you can always ipo a good company mm. you can always ipo a good company the question is what price can you ipo what rating will you get what price can you ipo it at so there's always a market for good companies um i think for fund managers it gets the more there are it gets difficult because Let's think about a typical fund manager. Maybe they hold 60, 70, 80, maybe 100 stocks on their portfolio. Mm. If you look on an annual basis, how many IPOs can you take on a portfolio on a year? Yeah. I mean, high single digit, maybe. Yeah. Um, but you're not going to put your whole, like, your, you're not going to turn your whole portfolio from companies you know mm. into companies that are new to the market. Yeah. Uh, so I think good ones can always IPO. I think we'll see a, a kind of good ones coming through and ones will be pulled. And we've already seen a few pulled. Uh, some will be pulled that what to show it won't happen. So I'm told by fund managers there's upwards of 40 potential IPOs out there for the rest of this year. Right. I doubt that we'll see 40 IPOs coming to market. And that's yeah, in the small okay. cap numbers that we yeah. do. That's yeah. that's up to about one and a half billion. I doubt we'll see 40 come to market, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. But you're going to get more secondary deals as well, I think, which, which is good for the market as well. Mm -hmm. I think UK companies are ready to do M&A. We've seen it this year so far. Uh, that is another demand on, that is another pull on cash for fund managers. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing some very good deals coming through by companies. Yeah, well, there was one, wasn't the last month, I think, was was Trellis Health in terms of uh, that was done at sort of, they were raising, I think, they're basically a resilience tech-enabled, AI-enabled 
um, healthcare business. Sort of, I think it's a spin out of EKF and, um, it was. and, and yeah. Mount Sinai. And uh, they've raised around about 28, 29 million pounds at 40p. And the shares are about 70 because of the, you know, it looks like a tremendous long term opportunity. I don't really want to talk through that one because uh, it certainly caught my eye. And I think if we're going to be more selective in terms of Mm. where we're going to put our cash, then that's certainly something that investors should should run the slider all over. Well, definitely. I mean, that's that meets that we talked about healthcare last time Mm. um, and we talked about testing, didn't we? Yes. Um, which is and testing is a way of helping to keep the cost down for the whole health system because you identify on this is early. Yeah. Um, Trellis is about lowering the cost of healthcare mm. again by ma- by maintaining people who have illness. In this case, uh, chronic diseases, isn't it? Chronic it's inflammatory diseases, bowel yeah. disease, Crohn's exactly. and, and colitis. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That, that by maintaining it in a very efficient AI helped driven way, mm. so you don't get to you don't get to this critical stage where people have to end up in hospital uh, yeah. and that massively lowers the cost of treatment and maintain maintenance of the illness, which of course is extremely attractive. You're an insurer, but in the yeah. U S extremely attractive. So you get more bang for buck yeah. uh, from the healthcare system by doing that. Um, and yeah. that's using technology in healthcare, uh, yeah. testing technology. As we said, healthcare is going to see big in big spend and it's going to continue. Yeah, that's the intersection of technology and science, isn't it? And again, I'd, 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 I'd highlight Trellis Health um, for investors to have a, a, a real good look at because, I mean, I ran the numbers and even at 71p, which it currently is, I mean, if you took a, just a hypothetical sort of 1% market share, and I think, that, I think there's 3 million patients who suffer from our IBD out in the States. If they take 1%, that's 30,000. Even I can do the math. You get $100 million turnover at 30% EBITDA margin, 15% EBITDA margin you get a theoretical share price nearly two pounds one pound 90 and it compares a 71 piece so i'm not i'm not surprised investors look reasonably happy about that listing anyway another stock for uh, investors to run the slider all over on the technology side is um is gresham tech that mm. uh, sort of did a I think it was a really sort of terrific transformational deal that gave them access into the um, into the stage you want to talk through that one because uh, obviously yeah. it dovetails into the secondary market side it does. That was obviously a second existing company on the market raising money, which is what we were talking about. Mm. And plenty of demand for good deals there. Uh, and what have they done? Well, let's do a little bit, rewind a little bit. Gresham are a global leader, which is maybe not quite that realized in the market. A global de- de- leader in what they do in reconciliation uh, at basically big international bulge bracket banks are some of their customers. Mm. So they're winning against companies all around the world in terms of putting systems in. And and you have to believe me on this, but some of these banks are still using Excel spreadsheets to reconcile. Yeah, no, I've heard that one many a time. They're sort of yeah. silos, aren't they? Incredible. Yeah, so it's it's moving into maybe not even the 21st century, moving into the 20th century for some people. But anyway, uh, Gresham Tech are the enabler of that. What's driving their business? Well, modernization of systems, fast data, but also compliance is obviously a big driver as well. Yeah, you know, reg tech. To see. Yeah, regulatory tech there. What does the US deal do? Well, it opens up. They've already got customers there, but that really opens up the US market for them as well. So again, an example there of an existing company doing a deal uh, which gets them access to that US market in a low risk way. I mean, going in organically, obviously, would be a lot slower uh, uh, and a great management team to drive it. Yeah, and it's a, I think that's sort of like the post-trade sort of um, deal, you know, trading platform, et cetera, in the States. That, that whole market's about 50%. So it's a real sort of like leap or step change for the company, isn't it? And it's real sort of mm. like uh, high recurring revenue streams, isn't it, with sort of high margins as well? It is. Once you're in, it's difficult to get, you know, once you're in there and you're doing it for them, it's, mm. it, you're not going to be kicked out. That does lead to a necessarily long sales cycle, of course, because yeah. you you're going to get taken and it takes longer but yeah they they are a global leader in what they do um yeah. so we oh. don't we don't have that many of those in the uk you know no oh, i know they get yeah. taken out often before you get there so it's nice yeah. to have a global leader there oh yeah well it's, i mean again I'll have a if investors have a look at that company because it's sort of like a uh it, it's a dominant player in a in a fairly small area but but uh obviously got great systems and uh I just do that. There's no estimates out there because obviously it's a blackout period whilst whilst the company raises money. But just doing the maths from me, 
and I mean, I reckon you, you won't be too far short of about 40 million pro forma revenues if you can do a bit of sort of cross selling. And the shares are only on they're less than 120. Um, the market cap's less than 120 million pounds. So that's less than three times sales, which for a, a sort of like a dominant player in a sort of like a small pond, high value recurring revenue stream in software is still very cheap. These kind of businesses go for five or six, seven times sales. So uh, certainly something that investors should should have a look at. And another one, which again, mm. came out with some reasonably good news about two or, two or three months ago, Big Disposal was Avintraz. It sold mm. its, uh, its Peter Brotherhood um, business. But again, this is another one which is uh, the shares have moved quite well but there still seems to be a lot of upside in that business because it does sort of critical I think it's critical safety type of um, uh, engineering parts things like uh, blast doors and um, sort of like high integrity steel boxes for like Sellafield yes it does I mean having trans is basically a mini, a mini Melrose um, and we know how successful Melrose has been over the years yeah. Um, they have their own acronym, High yeah. uh, Pinpoint Invest Exit. Yeah. Um, so quite a neat way there. And that's what they do. And you mentioned Peter Brotherhood. Mm. That they sold that for 35 million, four times return Brilliant. Uh, on that business. Now, you can't complain about that. But you're bang on in what they do. They've got a bit of medical in there as well, healthcare mm. in there as well, in terms of one of the divisions they're building up at the moment. And they've just done a deal there with an Australian company. This is kind of, you think about the MRI scanners, yeah. which the big donut ones that you might get put in. Yeah. They've got an innovative technology there in terms of much smaller. Yeah. Um, so if you think pets, if you think art, you want, might want to put just an arm or a leg or something yeah. like that. Uh, and neonatal and, babies and stuff like that, isn't exactly, it? Yeah. Exactly. So that's quite that's exciting part of their business there. That's the most nascent part of their business. But then, you, as you say, you've got the three M three uh, cylinders uh, boxes that they make. Yeah. Now, Sellafield, they're opening it out, and I um, mean, there's a television program the other day. I don't know whether you saw it, and it, it's quite frightening when you see it. You've got like weeds growing out the walls and stuff like this. Yeah. In those buildings, they're full of medium low, medium level waste. Once you open it out, you have to put that waste into containment boxes, and then they're all going to be stored much more yeah. safely than now at the moment. For a very well, long uh, time as well, and I understand it's yeah. five hundred years. <laughs> So it you can't is, just it have is. your normal yeah, sort yeah. of light steel box. Yeah, a long, long time. Now, they are preeminent supplier of those who are under contract. Uh, so that's a very long-term cracking yeah. business we've got there. And as you say, booth, et cetera. The management are brilliant at identifying businesses, mm. buying them sometimes out of receivership. Um, they've got a huge database of what of areas they'll be looking at. Um, they did do aerospace before. Um, and they sold that business very well, obviously, way before we went into this downturn. So, yeah, great company, a mini Melrose, uh, and, a great, and a really strong management team driving it. Yeah, and they've got they're pretty much cashed up, aren't they? After the sort of the Peter Brotherhood, I think they've got over twenty million of uh, of net cash at the moment, and I think they're also trying to sell some land uh, out of Luton, some spare land, which is another probably bringing out another ten mil in there. And if you if investors again, if ever investors want to have a look at this, I mean, I think the shares are roughly around about three seventy, three eighty, but. I mean, I did a, a just a very conservative sum of the parts, and I couldn't get anything less than five pounds a share. But uh, obviously, something of interest there. And if they buy well, which they've done, their track record of M and A has been terrific. If they buy well and utilise that cash, then there's no reason why they they can't significantly, you know, increase your health. I did actually look at the price chart. And over the last 10 years, the shares have increased by 20% per annum. I mean, it's a, it just shows you that success of the pie um, strategy. It is, it is, yeah, it is. And yeah. I think investors, if they wanted to do something bigger, would be there to back them and things like that. So it's a great, it's a great company. They, as you say, they've proven their strategy a number of times now in terms of this pie uh, uh, pinpoint, just to repeat, pinpoint invest exit. They've proven that works. So yeah. uh, a really strong story there. Yeah, well, thanks again then for your time, uh, Jamie. Brilliant. And um, it's, for investors, have a look at all three of those uh, companies. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. Definitely worth having a good look at. So until and let's next. See, yeah, and let's see if the let's see if any of those central banks do anything before we speak next time. Yeah, possibly. Yes. Anyway, no. so speak to you next month. Thanks a lot, Bye. Paul. Cheers. Bye. Bye.